amazing. Put your hands up. <laughs> Pack yourself on the, t- on the head, on the back, on the shoulder. That's great. Excellent. Thank you. I presume you. you were all dancing as well. Yeah. That's what I like to imagine. Yeah. And uh, dancing and drawing at the same time. That's impressive. Especially the... Um, yeah. Yeah. It's good. It's getting really I think good. there's a Princess Buttercup. Is there? Princess Buttercup. Oh. Who's thinking oh. of love? <laughs> to love. We'll follow you. Okay. Uh, is this is this where we make our semesterly plug for if you have not seen The Princess Bride? You must. Please see The Princess Bride. No, it's a non-negotiable. It's a non-negotiable. Yeah. It will make you happy. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so if you haven't seen this movie, it's a movie. See it. It's on Netflix. Uh, it has been. It has been on Netflix and a few right other now. places. If you do not have access to Princess Bride, get in touch with us <laughs> and we will hook you up. It is that good for you. <laughs> It seems it's on okay. Disney Plus right now. It's on Disney Plus right now? Because okay. Disney has purchased all, all the, the things. All the things. Okay. Get in touch with us if you if you do not have access. Amazing my, movie, someone my, says. Myself, I'm going to start watching it right here. Right here. Oh, look, they're all. Oh, we should have a screening. They're just going through the fire swamp. <laughs> so good. Okay. Rodents of unusual size. I don't believe in them. I don't think they exist. <laughs> um, okay. I, I don't want to interrupt your, your drawing, so we'll just take a minute and appreciate it because it's delightful. Um, and folks are still coming in, so that's fine. Today. What are we doing today? Oh, yeah. Some more terms. Physiology. Some more physiology. Um, and we're, we had you, um, we left off asking you to think a little bit about why um, the trigger for an adaptation to temperature change would not be temperature <laughs> and why it would be something like photo period um as a trailer between episodes i think you've got we've got to work on tightening that it's, yeah so previously previously on, on yeah it wasn't quite we the asked you why why the trigger for temperature isn't temperature <laughs> who is it um so yeah but like it wasn't really a huge cliffhanger but like it was, well, it was pretty good i hope you were like intrigued as to why that might be um and so please start thinking about why that might be while we finish drawing this because i'll uh screen capture it just as soon as wesley is finished with the dinosaur uh or is it a dinosaur or is it an iguana i don't know Lizard! <laughs> Lizard, damn it! Very fast. That must be a stylus as well. Yeah, super good. Okay. Um, and, uh, oh, there's a sea monster. It's your Famous boat. last words. Fantastic, yeah. There you were, rowing your boat across the loch in Scotland. Yeah. Oh, and a dinosaur. A blue one. Um, amazing. Okay, so we'll stop in ten seconds. Nessie! Says Holly. Um, good. Some people are having weird audio, but then there's uh, some chat that the audio is okay for them. So oh. if we're looking at the... Here, what if we did this? Is that better? Oh, you know what? We're running out of batteries. Oh, yeah? Yeah. We should do a battery change. Um... Well, that'll, that'll mess everything up. I went to the dairy bush and I saw no squirrels. <laughs> ba, 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 ba. <laughs> I went to the dairy bush. Yep. I saw and no squirrels. I saw no squirrels. Uh, it happens. They it saw happens. you. They saw you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. You got to go back. No. <laughs> well, you don't have to. Well, you don't have to. <laughs> I mean, it's there and yeah. it's a beautiful space. And... Yeah, it sure is. Okay. I was just in the Arboretum today. It was delightful. Um, here we go. I was there yesterday with our boys, and we saw the fox. Yeah. The male fox of the pair that hopefully has a den in front of the trail camera. Yeah. yeah. Where are you going to, little brown mouse? I'm off to see. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Come and have some lunch in my, my underground, underground house. house. That's terribly kind of you, fox. But, but no. no. Okay. Um, I, uh, oh, folks still coming in. Come on in, get settled. And I'm going to screenshot yeah, this and clear all draw. Are you ready? Clear all drawings. We're good. Okay. Here we go. Thank you. That was awesome. I'm going to be dancing and clear all dry. Okay. I'm just reading the. Oh, you're reading the captions? Yeah. Okay. So good. Now we're going to do some terms and some stuff, and we're going to get you to think a little bit about that trigger and why it would be photoperiod and not 
something maybe a little more proximate to temperature, like temperature. <laughs> um, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to think about the Arctic hare, right? Because it's like the flounder. It's tasty. <laughs> it's tasty like the flat one. No, it's kind of stringy, actually. Yeah, well, if you're hungry. Yeah, if you're hungry, though, yeah, for sure. A viable option. Um, so the Arctic hare uh, is a fantastic creature. Um, they are perhaps uh, a lot larger than you might be thinking. Uh, most of us will have seen uh, eastern cottontail rabbits, uh, which are about this big. Um, and an Arctic hare is <laughs> about that big. <laughs> um, and they, they, they don't, they don't, you don't usually see them hopping. You see them walking in a really gangly kind of awkward kind of way. Um, and, uh, and they're brilliant and they are like absolute, you know, Arctic survivors. They're fantastic. Um, and in the summer months, a lot of them look like the one uh, in this photo. So uh, you can actually see bits, tufts of white fur here and here that have still have yet to fall out. Um, but um, they do very much look like the brown rocks and the, the sort of tundra background backdrop of the summer uh, season up in the Arctic. Uh, and in the winter, Many of them look like this, um, which is delightful. This is kind of what we think about, perhaps, when we think about Arctic hair, um, with their little black tips there, um, really making them look like part of the background um, and, uh, and obviously related to being able to camouflage from predators and, and, and the, those types of things. So it can kind of change. Yep. It can change all over the place. So this was a study uh, that was done a couple of years ago um, where they looked at the a bunch of different measurements of the coat for Arctic animals. And we're looking at here two measurements of those uh, coat parameters in the Yukon, so Arctic-ish. And so in the upper left, we've got the length of the guard hair, and you can see it in the fall in the darker color and the uh, winter in the lighter color. So the guard hair gets longer, the density increases, the length of the downy hair, the, the insulative hair doesn't increase, and then there's another graph that I can't see, and it probably goes up. The density of downy hair. Yeah, it goes up. Yeah. Super. There but we go. But the length doesn't. Right. So lots of things are happening. It's not just one trait that's changing, right? There's like multiple systems level kind of traits happening in order to be able to um, adapt to the changing conditions and the changing temperatures and things like this. But there's an interesting sort of thing about the Arctic hare, um, and that is that not all of the population's respond to changes in seasons in the same way. And that provides an opportunity to learn more about some of these systems, right? We look for the exceptions because if they're breaking rules and they're still surviving, then there must be some competing, you know, competing variable at play. And so here's, here's our observation, right? That kind of gets us to go, hmm, that's curious. So these two images of, um, of Arctic hare, so same species, uh, were taken um, in the summer months. And one of them is kind of following our rule of matching to the background, and the other one isn't. And that's because the most northern populations of Arctic hare don't actually change color even though they do have some modifications to their fur um, and they do replace their fur, um, they're not changing the color. That's the thing that doesn't change. So they do have summer coats that are a little bit lighter, um, lighter in terms of like thickness, right? They're, they're, less, they're less dense, they're less insulative, but they all stay white instead of changing color to the, to the brown, okay? And it, the snow does melt for a short period within the, uh, within the high Arctic. So these are white hair that stay white on these darker backgrounds um, compared to, you know, the more southern Arctic areas 
um, where they do go through these, these changes in color. So what might explain this difference? And so here's kind of the line, right? Um, and of course, potentially with climate changes, these, this line is going to change as well. Um, but take a look. So all of those kind of below the line are going to be changing with the seasons. And then all of those above the line are not going to be changing color with the seasons. It's kind of a curious observation, right? And can you think of any explanations, anything that might, that we could like test a hypothesis that might um, support this observation? Any ideas? Throw them on the screen, throw them in the chat. Stays colder up north. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, it certainly does. It does. Yep. So you're hypothesizing that because it stays colder, that they need the extra insulation that the whiter hairs would provide. But then think about potential predatory costs yep. of being a white puffball <laughs> yep. in a dark world. Yep. Uh, wide temperature range below the line. Less predation. It takes less, it takes too much energy to change fur color for such a short period. That's interesting. Yep. Snow cover lasts longer. Maybe some snow remains uh, more up north. The warm season simply isn't long enough. The landscape stays white and icy. Yeah. Wes, Wesley, Wesley's asking if there's a, an island effect. That's hmm. really interesting. It certainly does coincide it with coincides. where there's a whole yeah. bunch of islands. Yeah. Now, for the Arctic hare, this isn't so much an island problem um, because a lot of the the water is frozen during the winter, and so it's really quite easy to go from one you know island to another. It's it's really only in the summer months that it can be a little bit challenging, but even then, there's quite a bit of ice, um, and so I think I I would say that it's coincident, but certainly that's a hypothesis that can be tested um, if there's an island effect. Okay. So, um, lots of, of good ideas. Um, yeah, natural selection, uh, also related to sunlight, like the antifreeze and fish. Could it be related to the fact that the sun never sets in the summer? That's, a great idea. <laughs> That's really good. Okay. So, lots of things going on. Um, and it hasn't really been fully demonstrated, but there is one hypothesis that you've thrown out there that is generally supported, you know, by, by the community. And that has to do with the cost associated with changing the color of your coat relative to the time that you will actually benefit from that color change. Um, color changes, just like any other types of changes physiologically, have a cost. Um, and the idea is that the summer, with this dark background in the high Arctic, is only really a matter of a few weeks, <laughs> maybe six weeks max. Um, and so the time associated with that, because it is such short duration relative to the cost of changing over the color of your coat, um, uh, doesn't balance out above the line, right? Think about that though, in the context of climate change, right? How is that cost benefit analysis going to be rebalanced if the high Arctic is getting that much warmer, mm -hmm. right? Think about that. And then we can also think about all of the other things that we know that change color, including these other nine, nine, nine um, uh, species, right? Where, where the idea of camouflage and the changing color of the background um, and adaptations to it can be disrupted in the context of this massive global climate change, right? And take a look at a couple things here. One of them is that the nine species that do this, are they monophyletically distributed across the phylogeny of mammals? There's certainly a bunch of hares, but a stoat and a weasel are Ooh. not closely related. The nope. Arctic fox, not closely lemming. related. The lemming, not closely related. So it seems to be a <laughs> wait, strategy. Wait, wait. There's something called the Siberian hamster. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is. That's and amazing. It does it. <laughs> so, so this is a strategy that has evolved convergently in mammals in Arctic environments, but 
also in high elevation environments. Yeah. Look at the distribution. There's there's a bunch of Arctic stories here, but in the same way that we've talked uh, back in the ecology unit about the abiotic factors that drive kind of high Arctic or polar change, lots of those same factors come into play when you're talking about high elevation yeah. populations. So lots of the same consequences of a potential decoupling of whatever the signal is are going to be in there. So it turns out that the uh, trigger, so this is where we connect to the flounder. See, they're not totally disconnected. <laughs> the trigger. The mountainous flounder population. <laughs> the what the flounder. Um, now, uh, the trigger is the same as the flounders, and that is photo period. Um, and it's actually been known for, for quite some time that it has to do with the seasons, the period of daylight rather than the actual temperature um, associated with, you know, with the environment around them. So Arctic hair are using photo period and many, 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 many things use photo period as their indicator. Think about why photo period? Why would that one be the trigger that would be selected for? Um, right. And let's explore potentially uh, some of the consequences of tying uh, seasonal changes to photo period. So in the context of climate change, what's the risk if your trigger is tied to photo period rather than actual temperature? And to help you along in thinking about that, um, here is a polling question. You can start reading it. I will throw it at you in a second. Hundred percent of those who've answered, answered. That's the statistic that we're seeing. That's very useful. <laughs> yeah, I've never noticed that one before. I, I wonder if it's a. Is there a? I, don't I, I haven't noticed it either. Option? We've seen a lot of polls over the last couple of years. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Just a few more seconds. We've got like well over eighty percent of you, so we're at eighty-four percent. Um, so we'll go with uh, five more seconds, four, three, two, one. Very good. 87%. Excellent. Okay, and we'll share your results. So indeed, yes, um, both the northern and the southern populations are going to experience... Um, Drag the pole over for the Oh, okay. There we go. There we go. Uh, so both the northern and the southern populations are going to experience higher levels of predation. And it's kind of neat because it's not for exactly the same reasons, right? So um, the southern population, what you might predict, right, would experience more predation uh, because they would be actually out of sync. So they would be uh, white on a dark background on the shoulder parts of the season, right? So for the beginning and perhaps even the end over time as, as things start to change. Um, so they would be out of sync. Um, and then the ones that live north of the line will be white for much longer because the background is going to be darker for longer as a result of, of increase in warming. Um, but both of them, you might predict them, would experience these higher um, rates of, of predation. Super. Good. 
Okay, so we're going to kind of shift gears a little bit and we're going to introduce two more terms. So we've been doing this kind of for the last couple of classes, two terms, kind of the opposite of each other, uh, to try to help you kind of appreciate some of the things that are going on with physiological systems just more generally. Um, and the terms that we're going to um, introduce to you today are the idea of freeze avoidance versus freeze tolerance. Okay. Um, good. So, uh, things that avoid freezing, things that um, are freeze avoiders, basically have some kinds of adaptations that can span like from population level to molecular level, right? So anywhere in there, the biological levels of organization, there's some adaptations that um, support the individual organism in not freezing. Uh, and like the list is long about the types of ways that that can happen from behavioral to physiological um, and everything in between, right? Um, but basically, they don't want to freeze. They cannot freeze or else uh, they will no longer be living. Freeze tolerant organisms, on the other hand, tolerate and manage freezing. So they actually freeze. And it's, yeah, so it's really critical, though, when you're learning these terms to recognize that when we talk about freeze avoidance and freeze tolerance, we are talking about the internal environment of the organism and not the environmental temperature, okay? The question is, in order to figure out whether they can freeze avoid or freeze tolerate is, is the tissue frozen? And if yes, is the organism still alive? <laughs> If the answer is yes to both of those things, it means that it's freeze tolerant. If the answer is uh, uh, no uh, to the first one and it's still alive, yes, then it's a freeze avoider. And if the answer is yes, it's frozen, but no, it's not alive, then it's a freeze avoider who didn't succeed. Okay? Eat it up. <laughs> So some examples of freeze avoidance include things like migration, right? Just getting out of there um, when it becomes really just too, uh, too cold to be able to survive. Um, we can talk about huddling too. I think about penguins and how they huddle together in order to prevent freezing in some pretty darn cold places. Um, we can talk about the molecular stuff, the antifreeze proteins, hibernation, supercooling, dehydration, all of those things uh, can be used in order to prevent freezing. Some of them are also helpful in controlling freezing. So it really depends on the condition, like dehydration, for example. Um, it really depends on the condition of the actual tissue and the sort of evolutionary history of the adaptations of the organism. And there's a whole bunch of lineages of, of taxa of, of, of species writ large, taxa, where they can, there are solutions, the, some have come up with one, some have come up with another. Right. Yeah. It's delightful and complex. Mm -hmm. Okay. So freeze tolerant. These things freeze like Walt Disney's head. Um, <laughs> like, but they but, come back. But unlike Walt Disney's head. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, they, uh, they freeze frozen, solid, like, and, or partially solid or anything in between. But there is actual frozen tissue in the organism at some point in their lifetime as a result of usually seasonality. Okay. Um, and it's delightful to study these things because it's things with which we are less familiar. Um, and so we're going to spend a little bit of time learning about freeze tolerance. But first, let's think a little bit about what a graph might look like if we were trying to differentiate between something that is freeze tolerant and freeze avoidance by looking at data. So imagine we've got two organisms One's freeze tolerant, one is not. They are very closely related. So we're not dealing with like, you know, a mammal and an insect. Um, maybe we're dealing with two insects. What types of variables might we graph on an X and Y axis to help us distinguish the difference between something that is freeze tolerant and freeze avoidant? So what might we study? What, what variables might be relevant here? 
Ideas in the chat. Temperature. Temperature. Interesting. Movement. Ooh, like if it's moving, brilliant. Oh, cool. <laughs> Survival rate. Yep. Interesting. Good. What else? What else? What else? Vital signs. <laughs> Heart rate. Good. I like it. Vital signs, activity in winter, metabolism, protective factors like thick fat or fur. Very good. Yep. Yep. Anything else? Enzyme functions, blood antifreeze protein levels. Good. That's really, really good. Okay, cool. Um, uh, let's, um, let's pick one. What do you want to pick? What do you want to pick? I like all of those. I like all of them. Um, can I throw out like a, a new one? One that hasn't been mentioned? Yes. Why is it not typing? Tissue paper. <laughs> That'll work, right? If we do this? Good. Okay. Tissue ice crystal concentration and time. <laughs> is it on our side? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So imagine we are going to have something that is freeze avoiding. Okay. What is that going to look like on this graph? Go ahead and give me a rainbow because I like those. Okay. Super. Good, good, good. Okay. So something that is free. <laughs> Very good. I like it. Ava's like, this is where they die. <laughs> Genius. Well done. I like that a lot. Yep. Good. And all of the other ones are fine too, for sure. Right? Like the idea is to avoid to the point where you can't. Good. Um, okay, so how about something that is freeze tolerant? What is that going to look like? Okay, good. Mm. Nice. Oh, oh. Like I'm guessing. No one wants the normal distribution. Alexander is going down. That's interesting to me. I guess it depends, right? Yeah, I'm liking this, like, this, like, thing there. <laughs> the curly line is the best. Okay. <laughs> is it annotated behind the uh, us? Is it annotated? Just kidding. <laughs> awesome. Okay. It's great. Yes, right? There may be some, there, there should be some fluctuation in it. So I do like the idea that you're exploring these, these curves over time. I also like the idea that you're like showing that it's changing over time, that it's increasing. That could be a shorter period of time, right? Um, so all of those are accurate, uh, given the fact that we haven't given you like actual numbers along the, along the thing. So that's, that's fantastic. Well done. Um, okay. We should change batteries. Yeah. Okay. We're going to get some batteries. <laughs> um, super. Let me just clear. Okay. There we go. Good. Oh, okay. This is something called super cooling. Um, just to give you an idea of what that looks like. Super cooling is important to distinguish between freeze tolerant and freeze intolerant because super cooling is an adaptation for freeze intolerant species to be able to be below freezing temperature. And so this is a demonstration of how a liquid can be below freezing temperature, but not freeze until you shake it just a little bit. Let's Okay. Can't wait? No, sure. It's all about the... There it goes. That's a good one. That's a good one. Woo! Why did you say two? Science. Science. <laughs> if our lips are moving and you can't hear us. It's working. Yeah. Cool. It's awesome. <laughs> 
Yay. Okay. So super cooling basically means that the, the liquid or the organism is very cold, but it isn't actually frozen, right? So think about our winter flounder, very cold, not actually, actually frozen. It uses antifreeze proteins. There are other organisms that use other things, right? Some of them upregulate um, uh, the concentration of, uh, of glucose to make it kind of not saltier, but sugarier, which lowers the freezing point. So they are then sort of very cold. But um, now, since the freezing point is different, they are not cold enough to actually freeze. There are other ways that you can do this, right? So sweet things, sweet things, sweet things, yeah. trehalose, glucolose, <laughs> glucolose, <laughs> urealose. <laughs> okay. This is kind of one of your favorite parts. So do you want to drive this one? I, yeah, I'll talk about this uh, a little bit, but not alone. This is a, a frogsicle. <laughs> this is a frogsicle that is probably within, depending on where you're sitting, certainly within kilometers, maybe within hundreds of meters of where you're sitting right now. Because this is a frog that we have here, but whose range extends above the tree line and into the into the north. It's the it's the widest distribution of any amphibian species. This is the wood frog that, uh, because I'm an old person, when I grew up, it was called Rana, which means frog, Sylvatica. Uh, now it's called Lithobates sylvaticus because uh, you got to keep the old people alert um, but, and angry. No, they, they tend <laughs> to migrate that way. No? Ah, there is. But you bring that up. I hate that paper. Um, <laughs> but anyhow, it needed to be done because, and this ties into what we've been talking to tree-based thinking and to monophyletic groups, because those things that used to be called rana, the frogs, or bufo, the toads, were not natural groups. They just kind of looked toad-like. And we knew that they weren't closely related. Sing, that's an aside. So this is a frogsicle. This is a species that is does not avoid getting frozen. We have amphibian species in this area, in, in the greater Guelph area. The majority of them are freeze avoiders. They either go underneath the water and bury themselves in the substrate at the bottom of the ponds or underneath the frost line. Those would be like bullfrogs, green frog, leopard frogs. Or terrestrial frogs like the like toads, uh, the American toad in this area, burrows in the ground underneath the frost line. And so it just avoids it. But spring peepers and wood frogs do this. So, and in some parts of the world, not in Guelph, as we get warmer and warmer and warmer for more of the year, but in the Yukon, in none of it, in uh, the Northwest Territories, even in high uh, latitude kind of Alberta and BC, frogs could spend more than half of their life in this state. So this is a really critically important, their capacity to do it means they can have such a wide range that you can see from space. Uh, so 65% of their body for maybe 65% of the year can be totally frozen as extracellular ice. Can I ask a question? Yes. Do, do the wood frogs who don't freeze live less long than the wood frogs who do? Uh, like? Like the ones that are at the southern end of their range that may not actually freeze? That's interesting. I don't know that it is known. Ha! That's a non-Dothraki. Let's know it. Tell you, Jack. Tell you. What, we, have a, we have a visitor. Tu vas bien? Bien. Bien dire bonjour. Here. Dis salut. Hello. Okay. Que veux-tu? You continue. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's an interesting question, and it is not known, but the hypothesis would be that Dr. Jacobs had come up with was probably that this is a costly thing. There must be a benefit, but if it's metabolic, metabolically very costly, you would imagine that probably they don't live as long. Oh, now, the, I was actually wondering the opposite. Oh, that if they live longer up north? Yeah, no. Yes. Yes. Interesting. I was going with physiological cost overall. and of that being, being alive. Froze, yeah, and that just, frozen was... Yeah. That's interesting. Can you see it both ways? Yeah, I can see it both ways. Huh. I'm we like have... Joni Mitchell. <laughs> How? I can see it from... I've seen the world from both sides now. <laughs> from high latitude and <laughs> no, scuzzy don't do guelph. <laughs> don't do it. Ah, uh, life's illusions. I'm a frozen frog. That's a note I can't hit. So... Uh, my apologies. We'll okay. scrub that from the video later on. Yeah. <laughs> High concentrations of osmolite. So this is the sugary thing. So glucose, glycerol, urea, um, protect that intracellular environment. So they might, they move the water out of the cell. 
Uh, and then they control the ice within the body. And that keeps the sharp pokey ends away from those membranes because otherwise, when spring comes, you just have... Goo? Yeah, a frog slurry. <laughs> okay, good. So. And this has been studied a lot, oddly, in Miami University, <laughs> which is in Ohio, which so many students have gone to do their graduate work at and in been... Oxford, really confused Ohio. why they're going to Ohio <laughs> when what they thought they had been accepted to is Miami Be careful. University. Uh -huh. It's very different. No beaches. There's many more wood frogs. <laughs> and so uh, Richard Lee and a bunch of other people have, star have, have studied uh, adults down to eggs, uh, tadpoles, and looked at. So they freeze solid, their organs dehydrate, and they use glucose principally as a cryoprotectant. So a lot of their life, outside of the importance of breeding, they breed explosively in the summertime. If you're sitting and wondering, do we have wood frogs near me? If you think, oh yeah, we've got a woodlot behind our place where I grew up that has a lot of ducks. <laughs> it's probably wood frogs. That's right. I once, what they I once it. attended a seminar like... by a professor who was at this university who said that there was a really big difference associated with whether or not you worked in Oxford or at Oxford. <laughs> All sorts of confusion. Yeah, there. yeah so they're, they're a mixed up kind of a place. <laughs> okay. So this is, uh, this is a sped up video of that process. I don't remember if they try and talk. In this amazing video, yeah. you can see a frog frozen solid at negative three degrees Celsius. It has no sign of life, no heartbeat, no breathing, no observable brain activity. As the animal gradually warms, life returns. Some good comments. They're shaking the flounder, flounder super cold. <laughs> And after he warms, he's right back at it, as if nothing has happened. He's ready to breed and create the next generation of frozen frogs. How do they do it? Well, Magic. the frog pulls water away no. from its vital organs and lets it freeze in the in-between spaces. Imagine if we could do this, Captain America suspend frogs, our lives and lose all signs of life, of time, then spring back when times are good. Though we know how it manages to avoid freezing damage, much of this amazing feat remains a mystery and may well for quite some time. There you go. Pretty cool, um, I think. Anyway, so quick question uh, about whether or not this is accomplished by supercooling. Actually, no. Supercooling, remember, is... Uh, remember, we just told you. Of course, you're not going to remember. Previously on Previously, 20, like on ago. five minutes ago, <laughs> supercooling um, is a freed, freeze avoidance strategy because... They are not actually frozen. They are just really cold. They're like doing the matrix underneath the thermometer going, <laughs> yeah, yeah, not no. us. Yeah. It's really, really important that in order to figure out if it's freeze avoiding or freeze tolerating, tolerating, the question is, is the tissue actually frozen? Do not ask what temperature it is. Ask if it's actually frozen. And there's another great question in the chat. Do some animals eat frozen frogs? Some animals do. The, the ground is frozen. So it's very hard to predate upon frozen frogs. And that's, that's potentially a, a way to avoid predation for much of the year because, for example, the leopard frog, the pickerel frog, the green frog, and the bullfrog that will be buried into the substrate underneath ponds in, in water at the bottom of ponds that don't freeze all the way to the bottom, they do get predated upon. Fish eat them. Yeah. Um, and what has this to do with super cool <laughs> no. hair? Do not go there. <laughs> so this is Smith with hair. <laughs> so um, And a Paisley shirt. Yeah, it was Genius. the it was the Yeah. This is early nineties. <laughs> yeah, this is me preparing to do the science that led to this paper eventually in the year two thousand. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a wood frog story. That, that's why there is the picture of the hair. Uh, this is the age. So I guess the other, I, I show it because I like revisiting my hair because uh, I, <laughs> I miss it. It was lovely. It often had color, not just white. Those, even the stuff on my face, it had color. Um, and then children. And then uh, children came. Yeah. <laughs> 
but uh, more smiles now. Um, <laughs> but I mention it because this person is kind of is you, right? This is uh, this is me about, at about your age, and within years had published this paper that that kind of made some people angry. Uh, so you too can go out and publish <laughs> things in the literature and, and piss off old guys, and that's kind of a good time. Um, so what I was looking at was this enzyme called photolyase. We had to, so it's, it's an enzymatic assay. This is my era as a physiological ecologist. And I was interested in this enzyme, which is kind of magic. It harnesses ultraviolet radiation to repair the principal form that ultraviolet B radiation causes to your DNA. So it has like, a, it's, it's, we don't have it really unfortunately for like a bald guy like me. Um, but ma many other forms of life do have it from bacteria to frogs, but not people to assay for this thing that we thought was important in how amphibian populations might be declining across the world meant I needed a lot of tissue. I, with my paisley shirt and my ringlets did not want to euthanize a lot of frogs. I, from my background of growing up in and around swamps and marshes and ponds and streams and rivers and lakes, knew that if one hung out by a road that bisected swamps or marshes or ponds or lakes or streams, knew that if we waited long enough, cars come along and they kill amphibians that are migrating. So I did that. And so I didn't have to write a proposal to euthanize or pith, they call it. It's awful. Um, I used amphibians that had already been killed. Uh, to get tissue samples to run my assay to write that paper. This leads me to sitting at the side of the road with a headlamp and a bucket. And actually, I had six buckets because I wanted to have a, one bucket for each of the species that I collected. So I, cars would go by and I would kind of go out with my headlamp and go like, there's a former wood frog. There's a former salamander. There's a former blue spotted salamander. There's a peeper. So I get all my buckets so that I can assay this material later on. And then I get all the material, but that means in kind of how you live your life as a graduate student, that you go back and you pop all that stuff in the freezer until you've got time to do it properly. So that means, so I was out, it was probably 11 or 12 degrees and a warmish spring night uh, with rain and winter was over. The amphibians knew it. The photo period told them. And we were out making these buckets of frogsicles. So we took them home, put them back in the freezer until we could get to work. Came home weeks later, literally pulled all of the things that are now at minus 20 in the, in the freezer. So they're, they're quite, quite cold. And I array them in their piles. I dump the bucket out. Uh, so there's the frogs of uh, wood frogs bucket. There's the blue spotted salamander bucket, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm dissecting away and it's kind of gross. Uh, but I know that I've got the tissue and none of these things have been killed specifically for me to do my work, which pleases me. And then a friend of mine comes in and I explain to him what he asks, what this seems kind of macabre, Alex, what are you doing? So I said, Dave, uh, what I'm doing is this and da, 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 da. And he's like, oh, that sounds pretty cool. He points over my shoulder. Why is that one moving? I was like, ha ha, you're very funny, Woodfine. Uh, and he's like, no, it is. And so I look over and one of the wood frogs that has been hit by a car, survived the winter, hit by a car and put back into the freezer is kind of moving. It's moving in a very similar way to what you just saw in that video of that frog kind of come back to life, uh, regain its movement in kind of a jittery fashion. One half of its body started to kind of pedal first, and so the other half's not quite awake yet. So this frog had survived the winter and the car incident and the refreezing with the scientist. And so we kept him in, and it was a him, in a, in a protected area. And he, he might not have been the smartest frog around, but we made sure that he got fed and we made sure that we took him back to a pond that had females. Uh, because we <laughs> figured. Because if you can survive that. <laughs> we figured if there, if there are, so if you ha are from the greater Peterborough area, um, and you've come across incredible wood frogs that stand in front of your car and do like the moose in Newfoundland does, <laughs> uh, I might have be the cause of that. <laughs> Wonderful. I love it. Thank you. So there. Good story. This is, this is a Smith slide. It has. And it has hail. like all my words. story comes out. Yeah. Yeah. The Smith. Yeah. There we go. Came back to life. There are the points. Overwintered. That wow. You hit all of the points. Well done.
Okay. Adapted for traffic. <laughs> it's pre-adapted. <laughs> that, yeah. that could be a study that you do. <laughs> yeah. We'll talk about uh, Premier Ford and his 413 or 403, whatever that crazy road is. Yeah, let's not. Um, okay. So, with something to think about, right? The winter flounder and the wood frog both experience temperatures below freezing, yet their tissues respond in very different ways, right? The both of them are cold, like darn cold. Yeah. So this is not helpful for telling us about uh, whether or not something is freeze avoiding or freeze tolerating. The question is, is the tissue actually frozen? Are there ice crystals proxim like like in proximity to the actual cells? Okay. Um, and that will be able to help you understand. So there are actually relatively few things that are freeze tolerant. They are the physiological exceptions that attract the attention of researchers, of scientists, uh, because they are, you know, quite rare and quite interesting. There are some things that um, have adapted to surviving very, very dry periods by dehydrating, which is another form of extreme physiology. Yeah. Keep on. Oh, well, I have a... No, no, go okay. ahead. Well, I was just going to, uh, you re-interrupt me if this doesn't fit in with where you were going, but I was going to talk about the fact that there are, there are people, we mentioned Walt Disney earlier, but there are <laughs> engineers, bioengineers who are interested in these kinds of technology and, and maybe for Walt Disney kind of things. But most immediately, we've used technology um, because of wood frogs and somebody mentioned in the in the chat tardigrades uh, that are also extremely good at this we've adapted some of their sugars one of them that i mentioned earlier called trehalose and we use it in molecular biology labs to make more thermostable mixtures of dna so that we don't have to sit in a big ice bath and make and mix our reagents that we can keep them at room temperature and they're it's easier on the dna as as we work and so they last longer, and, and that's kind of an unanticipated uh, advantage to this kind of, of yep. technology. And certainly it, the scalability is such that it just wouldn't work for us to apply the technology directly to our own bodies, right? Yeah. We're not going to, like, freeze our bodies like wood frogs do. It just wouldn't make any sense. Um, but some of the stuff that we have learned from wood frogs has been helpful in technologies like organ transplant. Uh, how to yeah. preserve tissue longer for um, transportation, for example, um, to increase the viability of the organs and to make it possible to, to do more transplants. So these types of studies do have potentially a, a big applied uh, area of research within within medicine. Maybe in the Marvel universe, like if you had to get back to Peggy Carter, if that was just all you had to do as Captain America, you needed to free solid and... Like, <laughs> Outside okay. of that. So we have some questions for you to think about some more kind of, you know, uh, puzzlers, the ones that always start with it depends uh, when you try to answer them. Oh, are you getting yeah the labeling because you didn't uh, erase it for a while. It was sitting over top of the, oh. of the frog. So like... <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. So are the there... inverse princess did. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> are there any freeze tolerant endotherms? Think about that one. And we, we will explore some fantastic and very oh unusual Oh, my God, the graphs. The graphs. Yeah. Yeah. In the next it's coming up. One. It's great. Yeah. Um, okay. Do all endotherms attempt to regulate a constant high body temperature at all times in the cold? Uh, how do endotherms deal with extreme cold? Does it depend on time scale of exposure? How these are probably types of questions that you're, you're kind of used to, you know, uh, experiencing with us and so we just thought to kind of write them out because we will be working through them over the next uh, few classes to help you come up with answers. You can also graph stuff. Uh, finally here, tiny bit of homework where we're probably not even going to take this up. It's, it's quite simple just to help you understand the difference between freeze tolerant strategies and freeze intolerant. If you do get stuck, let us know. Um, but, you know, you should be able to do this either, um, you know, uh, following this lecture or with just a little bit of Googling to find out what each of these things are. Okay. Yep. Great. And with that, right yeah. on time. Take care, everyone. Yeah. Take care of each other. Take care of you. Um, things are not easy. Nope. So don't, uh, so expect kindness and deliver it. And lower expectations. Take care.